Good day, everyone. Well, um, we are seeing um, a, uh, the, the second half of a market that uh, has uh, this uh, nice little multiple personality going on. Um, we had a uh, quite a strong rally on the basis of volume and leading stocks and market averages uh, yesterday. And now we're seeing these um, averages give back their gains. Uh, we're seeing um, essentially uh, the market was relieved yesterday because the Fed stayed rate friendly and they didn't say anything really that new. Um, and so the market took that as a positive, so started to really accelerate gains um, after the minutes came out. Um, and uh, the, mar the major averages got, the S&P and the NASDAQ got close to their 50s, didn't quite get there. And uh, of course the 50 could act as uh, some uh, resistance to these averages uh, pushing through. Um, and now we're, uh, we're seeing the markets trying to decide whether they're going to be uh, continuing this downtrend or whether um, yesterday's uh, positive action can um, actually uh, put the floor in um, into this market. Now we know that at prior floors you can see that the volatility tends to increase uh, when the market is trying to find its level. The market will come straight down um, like, on, like, like it fell through a trap door like it did a number of times before like on uh, the 3rd of February of this year or um, the 10th of April um, and then it maybe takes a day and then it shoots back up and that makes uh, of course market timing extremely challenging when the market's um, acting in that way. And uh, so the question is whether we're going to see um, that sort of action again. Right now, everything's showing a lot of volatility. Um, so essentially, um, we have to see the market uh, digest the fact that QE ends this month. So on that, on that note, uh, it's possible the, uh, the bounce will be shorter lived than before. Uh, on the other hand, we still have 20 days left in the month, so maybe this bounce retests the old highs and then rolls over. Um, we uh, have um, a market that really is, uh, I guess it can't really decide what, what it wants to do, um, and that's creating a lot of this, uh, these riptide uh, currents. Um, it's interesting also because yesterday we saw a number of good pocket pivots come through, so it was a pretty strong rally um, all in all. So to see the market just give back the gains all in one fell swoop, swoop so quickly today is pretty unusual, and it does speak to uh, the volatile tendencies of the market trying to make up its mind. Gil? Yeah. Uh, I, I think the market probably is going to head lower. I think if it can't build on this rally, it's probably headed lower. But you can see that in the NASDAQ, this is very volatile right in here. Zoom, zoom, back and forth. And maybe you undercut the lows and try to rally, but this is starting to look pretty nasty. And uh, what, I, what I can say definitively is that uh, yesterday, midday, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, just before the Fed minutes were released, I tweeted that a number of stocks, uh, or rather the stocks that I've been watching on the long side, I've had a, a small number of stocks that I've been watching and focusing on as, as go-to stocks on the long side if I see the market turn. So I'm always ready for the market to turn, but I'm also always ready for it to blow apart because it's a QE market. And I think trying to make sense of it <clears throat> but through market timing uh, and using ETFs or trading the indexes makes it even harder. And I think focusing on the stocks makes things a lot simpler and allows you to get in uh, into a position where you have some, you're in a little bit ahead of the market. Like if you bought in, I started buying stocks just as I saw these buy signals yesterday in a number of stocks, let me just show you which ones and I'll go through the, the five minutes here. Um, let's start with Twitter. Twitter is getting pounded in the morning uh, yesterday, if you're watching it. Let's see. Or is this uh, yesterday? Yeah. And they're pounding it in the morning, right off the opening. So 6.30 my time, that's when it opened up and then they, they pounded it. I was actually playing it short and then it got, you see the MACD stretch and at that point it's getting very stretched to the downside. So I, I start covering and taking profits. As it turns back up through here, I cover whatever I have left that I didn't take profits on. I'll hold a core position when I cover sometimes on a MACD stretch like that. And then, then you turn on these buy signals here. So now I'm flipping long. And we, we end up on the day. And then you open up this morning and the thing's going higher, going higher, going higher. Then I felt at this point, a couple of MACD stretches. You got this cross here. Yeah, you're looking to get horse in the mouth. Take the profits and run fast. 
and that's what I did on, on Twitter. And then you look at another one, Mobileye was another one, did the same, almost the same thing. Broke down early in the day, and then you get a buy signal here. And this is notice 10.30, right around 10.30, uh, just before 11 o'clock my time, and the Fed minutes came out at 11. So all this took place just before the Fed meeting. And uh, so I'm flipping to the long side, and all these things work, and this thing runs up, up today because uh, I guess Tesla's going to announce a Model D, which some are speculating is going to use driverless technology, which is what Mobileye uses, blah, blah, blah. I personally think... It's probably a sell the news, especially with the way the market's acting uh, and the breakdown you're seeing also in Tesla going through the 50-day. I think that's a short. I'm short LinkedIn, Tesla, and Yelp right now, and I hit those earlier as I was flipping out of my long. So those are all coming down. So I'm, I'm actually up on the day not pretty nicely, to tell you the truth. Uh, and it was very strange being long these other stocks. Let me just continue with my diatribe here. Loco was another one coming off the lows yesterday, off the 10-day. And now it's backing down. But, you know, this is one that's held up. And if you look at it on a weekly chart, that's a nice, you know, cup with hell. Maybe it just continues to build a base if the market goes through a correction, assuming we don't go through an outright bear market. But I think there's some chance of that. I'm not, I don't really get into trying to predict what the indexes are going to do per se. I watch the stocks and they tell me everything. So one of the things I'm thinking this morning with Loco up, with Twitter up, uh, Palo Alto Networks is another one bouncing off the 10-day and the 20-day. And we can see here, uh, you get the buy signal. It's getting hammered in the morning. I'm sorry, wrong day. Here, it's getting hammered in the morning. And then you get the buy signal right around 1030. And so I'm seeing all of this happen at the exact same time. In the past, when the market has turned and I'm seeing that sort of thing, and everybody's bearish and it looks like the end of the world, that has been a good time to get along. So I, I acted on it again because it's what I've seen before. And then generally what happens is these stocks will act well. The market will flip around a little bit. The next day, if you have a big update like we did yesterday, you'll come in some, you know, and maybe retrace as much as half of the prior day's move or something like that, some retracement early in the day, and then the market will right itself. Meanwhile, all these stocks that you're long that you bought, that I buy on the basis of this uh, turn yesterday, are acting well. So that's what was happening this morning, and I'm seeing all this like, wow, my stocks are acting pretty well. Market's coming down 120, 130, 140 on the Dow. And then it starts to rally back to uh, uh, like minus 90, I guess we got to minus 70 something early in the day. So it looked like we're going to turn. Then we roll back. And as we roll back, we're retesting the lows. Once we go through them, that's it for me. I'm gone. I sold my longs this morning and took my profits, whatever I had. And uh, certainly wasn't as much as I had earlier in the day when things were much a, a little bit higher. Uh, but, you know, it's basically splitting hair as far as I'm concerned. Uh, getting to the right side of the market for the big move is where you want to be. Yesterday, the big move was on the long side. Today, it started out on the long side. But this is getting uglier by the minute here. We're down 315 on the Dow, down 8368. Make that 8384. Make that 83 and 84. Whoop. Do I hear 85? <clears throat> Minus 8436. And just getting uglier and uglier. So to me, this is, you know, looking at these stocks, let's see, what was the other one? Oh, Gilead, too, is another one that acted well yesterday on a pocket pivot. And you can see this thing didn't really come off yesterday, and then it turned early in the day and then just took off. But anyways, all these stocks were doing well this morning. I think Gilead was the only one down. And the market's getting hit. And I'm thinking, okay, this is pretty much like other times where I've seen the individual stocks flash the buy signals as the market is turning off the lows. And so if you sit around waiting for a, for a uh, follow-through day, you're going to be late. And, uh, and, then, and so what's happened today is it's not, that has not been the case. So the market's thrown a big curveball in this regard. Unfortunately, uh, I react quick enough and I was up on my long positions because I was on margin coming in this morning on the long side. Uh, and uh, I mean, it looked, looked to me like we were going to turn back to the upside earlier and we might be off to the races, but no such luck. So, you know, I take it on its face value right now. This market's getting... Uh, clocked, and all these stocks are getting clocked. You can see, look at the shorts. Uh, Yelp. I look at Yelp as a, a big, ugly head and shoulders type thing. So here you are in a little bear flag, and you bounce off the 20-day. I think it's going lower. Plus, they were touting it on uh, Fox, I guess, around 80 bucks a couple weeks ago. So um, Let's see. Tesla. 
Yeah, the big news, you, get a, you had an outside reversal day yesterday to the downside. So this thing was actually trading down around, I don't know, 255 or so, 254, 3, somewhere around there, uh, early in the day. And so it looked like a uh, outside reversal yesterday. And then it turns back and it closes pretty tight. So now you have to look at this sort of even-handedly and say, oh, well, it could go either way. So it tries to go higher today. Once it fails at the 50-day, uh, and, and actually earlier today I went shorted on the basis of the 620 flip right here. Uh, when you broke down, and uh, but I think now that it's breaking down below the 50-day, uh, it becomes a short sale target again. You can see we have the fractal head and shoulders, and now you sort of have you could draw sort of a descending neckline along this low and this low. You can see that, um, and so now maybe today you get a big outside reversal. I hope so because I've got a pretty big short position in it, and I'm pushing higher uh, on everything right now. So. I'm having a good time. Anyways, um, let's see. Dr. K, are you ready for this, Dr. K? Yeah. Are you are you alert and chipper there? Okay. Okay. Can you explain the difference in the percent gains or losses in the UVXY versus the actual VIX? The UVXY is supposed to be two X. Well, I can answer that. There are variations in the ETF versus the actual VIX. You see that in all ETFs. They don't exactly mirror penny for penny or percentage for percentage point uh, you know that the, what they the underlying uh, uh, vehicle whether that's the VIX or, or an index or whatever so that's the difference uh, right dr. can yeah, there's, there's, there's gonna be yeah on a, on a short term exodus you'll see that there's um, massive differences actually that's why the, the model does not use the VIX uh, well the VIX is at best really a secondary or tertiary indicator for the model um, there's other there's other factors that are far more important and pressing um, when it comes to uh, UVXY. So um, yeah, just because the VIX is up 20% one day doesn't mean that the UVXY is going to correlate to that. Um, but there will be a rough correlation, a loose, a very very loose correlation. Um, and you'll also notice that UVXY tends to trend lower, whereas the VIX naturally does not tend to trend lower. It tends to gain its floor and then you know it'll do its thing. Um, but it stays in a fairly um, predictable band if you look back over the years um, whereas UVXY tends to trend um, lower much lower yeah and we're not really putting out signals on that anymore so it's kind of irrelevant really uh, Dr. K is this kind of market volatility usually associated with market tops my quick answer to that is who really cares you know I think it's also associated with uh, my cravings for fillet of fish sandwiches, but you know that and and 750 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Uh, let's see, uh, Doctor K, do you want to say anything about whether volatility is associated with market tops? I think it's associated well, with volatility it, more than anything, but you know, you know, when it comes to stock, individual stocks, um, yes, a, a stock that starts to go unusually volatile after a big run, that's often the top. And um, that, you know that's a very big clue, and you you know you should watch that. When it when it comes to indices, not necessarily. Um, sometimes they just kind of will start rolling over, and then it's only later as they start to really correct that uh, you get an increase in volatility. So you don't have to see uh, a lot of volatility in market tops, in on behalf of indexes. I think what's flashing a big warning sign, at least to me, is the utter bizarre behavior of the market and the vol the intraday volatility. The crazy moves you're seeing in certain stocks, one way and then the other, and because uh, because you look at some of these uh, names, you know, like Mobileye, looking like it's a Bible gap up, and then they hammer it right back in. You look at Anet, for example, Ariston Networks, nice breakout, looks like a flag breakout, looks like it's going higher, and then they hammer it back in and send it down to a lower low, probably bounces off the 10-week line right there. Yeah, right there you see on the weekly chart it bounces <laughs> off the 10-week line, and uh, I think all this probably. I keep telling my wife, go to the ATM and get more cash out because something's probably going to happen here, and it isn't going to be pretty. Uh, that's just my thinking here. I don't, I don't. It seems bizarre, and, and what tells me that something is really kind of out of kilter here is I'm not seeing the same pattern that I've seen before when I buy stocks and the a market makes a what looks like a significant low, and you see several leading stocks flashing pocket pivots uh, and acting. Uh, acting well as they find support, say, off of the 10-day or the 20-day moving average, you come into them at that point, 
And generally that all moves with the market. The market turns and goes higher. And that's how it's worked coming off of these lows. And that's one technique I've used to be up uh, as much as I am uh, this year and, and doing over 50% last year uh, from around, I think, from the time I got out of the hospital. But anyways, uh, but that's because I shifted my methods. And you began, I began to see what the market does. And the fact that it's paying attention to the indexes doesn't really get you to... Uh, profitable trades, looking at the individual stocks. And sometimes you see them doing things on days when the market's getting hammered and some stocks are moving higher. We've seen that with G-Pro many, uh, many days. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, so that's what I'm seeing. And I think that is very cautionary. Now, had the market turned right at itself, I would be very bullish here. But based on what I'm seeing right now, I have to shift my view. And I did. I shifted my money from the long side uh, after making some money going long yesterday before I'm sitting around waiting for something to confirm or a follow through day and then shifting to the short side as soon as I see things start to break. And I think that's really the key is to be flexible and to be able to see what the market's doing in real time. And essentially, uh, you know, th there's that old Buddhist, uh, or I think it's a Taoist, uh, ideal of the uncarved block. So, you know, I, I try to come in every day. I've got a strategy I know what I'm looking at in terms of long and short setups, but also I don't want to have a bias. You know, I go with the action as I see it because you can, that can work against you in two ways. You can, number one, be positioned on the wrong side of the market and stay there too long uh, because you think you're, you're going to operate on the basis of an opinion and just maintain that opinion rather than shifting with the market. But it can also keep you from shifting with the market and making money by moving with the flow. And so it's not, not a very easy thing to do. I've gotten much better at it over the years, and I paid a fair amount of tuition in the process. But I think that's really where you want to stay in terms of where your head's at. So you know, I, you, on Twitter, I know, see, I get a lot of tweets from guys. Everybody wants to get into a pissing match. There's a lot of egos, a lot of opinions. I like to have fun with it myself, but I don't, uh, I don't get hung up on what I think at any given point. I can be wrong and uh, as I've told you guys many, many times, I keep a little sign on my trading monitors that say I must lose to win. And you have to embrace that and also be able to understand what the market's telling you or see it and not not be caught in any particular frame of reference. Anyways, uh, let's see. Doctor, let's see now. Let's see. Let's Somebody says, looks like this market could form an H&S top if we get a little year-end rally. I don't know. That's kind of neither here nor there. Tell me what it's doing right now. Uh, one watches price and volume. It's supposed to be up price and volume, but with high-frequency trading dominating the market, how can volume tell us anything useful? Uh, that's a good point. In fact, some make the point that when you look at a level two screen with all the bids and the offers up there, 90% of those are coming from HFTs, and they move. They don't... Uh, it's like the guys on the NYSE floor used to tell me back in the early 2000s, like around 2002, 2003, when electronic trading started to take over. Uh, the specialists, their books would be flashing. Everything would be flashing because the bids and the offers are all changing constantly. Uh, and I think that affects it. And there's a lot of, I think a lot of the volume is coming through the HFT. So I've often posed the question, what if the opening bell rang and nobody came? Um, you know, so in other words, would, would the HFTs all be left to playing with themselves? Possibly so. Um, Dr. K, how far does the market have to fall before the MDM goes back to cash sell signal? Well, if there's no percentage. I mean, you know, you can't, uh, you can't assign strict percentages. Everyone wants everything in a nice little box wrapped up, you know, and, and the market doesn't work that way. So to say, declare, oh, it has to fall, you know, X percent is uh, really going against you know, the, the, the idea, uh, the inherent logic behind the model, which is to take everything in context. Dr. K, or someone says, uh, can either or both of you share your thoughts on buy and hold inverse ETFs? I don't buy and hold inverse ETFs or any ETFs, so I have no thoughts or anything to say about it. Do you, Dr. K? Yeah, you can, you can, you can um, do what I've done, and that was uh, I had a very long-term hold on uh, one of the uh, volatility uh, ETFs, um, and it is a core position, so in other words, I would trade around it, meaning I'd, have, I'd, I'd never sell the core out, but I might buy some additional and then sell, sell what I bought uh, based on model signals. Um, and certainly that's a, that is a viable strategy. 
um, provided you also know your risk uh, levels when you get into that kind of trade. In other words, your core position as a percentage of your account should be in line with your risk tolerance levels in the event that you might have to sit through some hairy corrections. Otherwise, what's going to happen is you're going to end up selling that core position prematurely, um, often on a market reaction low. So you got to be very careful about that. But it is, it's a viable strategy that, was, uh, that did work for me, and I closed out the trade just recent, just a few days ago um, after having bought it in October. So it's a very long-term hold for me. I mean, most of the time I'm in this kind of market, uh, get, into, get into something, and I'm out within a matter of days, um, you know, with the idea to take profits when I have them, um, as opposed to the old school idea back when the markets had uh, proper trends, um, that is to buy and pyramid a position. So that's where you make your big money. And that worked brilliantly in the 80s and 90s. Um, it also worked in the, in the last 10 years. We've had um, a couple situations where that worked very well, like 2003. But since QE's been on board, it, it's been, been a very difficult uh, way, way to make money. I mean, for every Tesla stock out there that does work, there's a, a score of others that don't. So the odds are kind of against you to find that one and pyramid it. Um, you can, however, find the, the next Tesla, because Tesla's pretty obviously a, a, a very um, model type reference standard stock, given everything it was doing, um, fundamentally and technically, um, when it, uh, you know, earlier on in, in, the, in the price move. And for that kind of stock where you have such a huge furious gain in a short time, you don't want to take your profits because, again, it's contextual. You have a great stock on your hands. And um, I wouldn't pyramid it because, again, it's not the pyramiding kind of environment, but you could sit and hold on your position and use something like the seven-week rule um, to get you out. And uh, that seven-week rule, again, it, you have to be very, very selective about the stocks you, in this market that you apply that rule to because, in general, um, many stocks get started and then stop. So, you know, I found it generally it's better if you're not 100% on a stock, but it's good enough to buy, take your profits when you have them. Without question. And if you have a stock, in, in most cases, that's up big on a day or two or three days, uh, my general rule is like 10% in two days or 15 in three, uh, I'll take, uh, take profits and I'll do it without fail. I don't, I don't sit around waiting for the market to take it back, which is what it does in most cases. Okay, let's see. Any uh, any brilliant questions out there? You're seeing the market starting to try and bounce off the lows of the uh, of the day. I'm looking at some of these 620s. Like, look at uh, Tesla. You know, it comes down hard. Not not as much of a MACD stretch as before. So, you know, it's possible that would be a short place uh, to take some profits if you're short from up here. But I think this thing's going a lot lower, and I think once the announcement for this something D or whatever the heck it is comes out, I don't think that many people are going to be impressed. So uh, it's just going to be another model, but they still got to make batteries for them all. So, you know, neither here nor there as far as I'm concerned. Um, any other questions out there? I don't really see anything. Um... So here, you know, market's trying to, we're seeing a turn in the market here. Let's look at this. And, you know, after coming down, I think that looks pretty normal. We'll see how this thing closes. I don't really give it too much hope, though. It doesn't, it doesn't look good. We started out, you know, this morning, the good news was that the market, uh, well, the bad news is the market was down. The good news was it was on uh, light volume. But back then, I think the NASDAQ was down minus 13 or percent or so in the volume. Now we're only down 875, 8.75 percent, and the NAS, uh, NYC volume is now up. So, we're seeing volume pick up as the market comes down. So let's take a look and see where we're at here as far as the, uh, let's look at the NASDAQ again. Oops. Somebody says, uh, this market has more swings than a hedonist vacation. Uh, most of us are likely just wanting to scream help, no specific questions. Um, yeah, I would, I would uh, agree with you there. I mean, like I said, mar this market's screwy, and I think that's a danger sign. 
And so I, I took my profits on the long side. I don't know if I want to be long this market. I, I am short and making some money here, so we'll see what happens. But anything could happen. And I'm, my, my thinking is it's possible if the market doesn't really blow apart and starts flying around in some more, then I think you just got to kind of back off and not try to get too aggressive one way or the other. So um, anyways... Relevance of volume data, somebody's saying relevance of volume data in this high frequency env environment, it's, as we were saying, it may not have that much relevance. Therefore, it may not be possible to draw conclusions from market action yesterday and today. No, but you can draw conclusions based on what individual stocks are doing, and that's what I prefer to do because that's really the only concrete way I've found of getting a handle on this bizarre QE market. Because trying to figure things out you know, and, and time things on the index is very, very difficult. And nutty. So, uh, let's see. I'm enjoying the cast as somebody, I, and I think you, you should because it's probably pretty comfortable right now. Um, but I don't know. If I smell something on the short side, I'm always happy to run after it and hunt it down. Uh, here's a historical, an historical question. Back in the 1990s when breakouts worked, did you use wider stops or did they just go straight up? Uh, in the 1999, everything just went straight up. So, and we probably did use wider stops, right, Dr. K? Because things trended more coherently, I think. You know, yeah, I have absolutely. to go back and, and relive my visceral experience, but I, I, I remember uh, in 1999 things went straight up, but things always had, had some volatility to them. And shakeouts to the 50-day line of the 10-week moving average uh, would occur. So... Yeah, violation of the 10-day worked very well um, in terms of getting me out of my positions uh, without selling them too soon. And I found that, um, that uh, you know, obviously your stop should be based on the stock's volatility. Uh, so you want to have wider stops if the stock's more volatile. Um, but in terms of using the 10-day uh, violation, um, which I think I, that was something I came up with, I mean, be, even before O'Neill. And I found it worked very well in 1995, um, which was, uh, that was my first triple-digit year ever. And, uh, you know, I, I just kept sticking with it, and, it, you know, it's been a godsend. Um, you know, I remember it was met with so much resistance because back then in the 90s, people didn't use 10-day moving averages. They thought that was too no, short. They did. 50-day yeah. and 200. And I remember Bill just thought it was nonsense um, until I started to prove him otherwise just based on my, the returns I was able to make um, using his money. And uh, I know he started dabbling in it and started studying it, and, you know, but... Ultimately, you know, it's it's difficult, I think, for someone who's used to doing something the same way, you know, for 40 years to just switch gears all of a sudden and say, all right, well, yeah, let's start using the 10-day. And the other issue is um, if you have the kind of money that Bill had at that time and, and still does, uh, you know, the 10-day is less meaningful because you really kind of have to build a big position and then you can't just flip out of it because you're going to move the price um, pretty substantially. So, you know, for a guy like him who's, you know, trading as much as he was, or the amount he was, you almost need to use a 50-day um, in a longer-term time frame. But when you have smaller accounts, and smaller accounts meaning, you know, under 50 million or whatever, that you, you know, you can, the 10-day works fantastic. Yeah, but Dr. K, I would argue that it's not necessarily the godsend you might make it out to be in the 90s. I think that the, mar the parabolic market of the 90s was really uh, the godsend, because I, mean, I was up 525% in 95. That was the first year I ever posted triple digits, and I wasn't using any 10-day. I didn't even know about a 10-day, and in 1999, I was up over 1,000% in my personal account and not using the 10-day. So I think a lot of the, you know, getting... Well, it's a different huge, style. Huge return, I mean, but to, but to argue that huge returns are due to using the 10-day, I think is not necessary. And Mike, and I, I would say... I would say it this way, um, the 10 day is an excellent tool, which if used correctly can yield very high returns. Now, is it the only method? No, of course not. But I'd never say that. There's lots of ways to skin a cat. So, and the okay. more of a trend you have, the more of a powerful trending market well, you think have, about it this way. the more how ways much, uh, to skin that cat. What were, how much were you up in your personal account in 99? Well, from, uh, you know how much I was up from... Uh, no, if you, much, if you just tell me, 1999, that year, what were you up that year in your personal account? In the big account, it was 587. No, no, no. And, right. In your personal and the smaller account, account yeah. was 561. But if All you right. take, you can't just take one year, obviously. But, uh, but, that but let me make this point. And it kind of happened. Got to go from night. Let's go from 95 to 2003. I was up over 80,000 percent during that time frame. But but I'm saying in that, that, line, was, that was not suffering much uh, in 2002. In 99, if you hadn't used a 10-day line, maybe you could have been up a thousand percent like me. 
Uh, but but the point is, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't <laughs> just select one year because then that's that's not a proper study. You have to go and look but at I didn't many use years. It in, I didn't use it in '95 either. So I mean, I started I started using it in early '90s, and it worked very well. And I would say I, I think that, it's a useful rule, but I don't necessarily think it's like if you only used it in if you only didn't use it in '99, how would you know that it's year not to use it? You know, it's one of those uh, proven negative thing. Anyways. Uh, and you gotta take. You gotta. You can't take I'm one year. It's like saying, "Oh, how much were you for the month?" Therefore, that indicator works for that month. You gotta take a long span of time. I mean, I would say at least ten years minimum to get a sense of how something. Uh, oh, look at all the questions coming in. I knew if we got something going here, we'd rile people up. <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't exaggerate the potency. Of and 90, 99 was an aberration as well. So you know, tool certain tools that worked up to 99 um, don't and validate them just because 99 was an aberration and maybe that tool didn't work as well. And I, I would actually say though, in 99, I was able to handle up to 20 positions at a time with very lower, much lower risk and much lower drawdown because I had so many positions. And it was simply because of the 10 day kept, kept my risk at a more limited, limited profile. Um, let's see. QE will morph into VE, verbal easing. Yeah, that might be true. Yesterday on Twitter, you said fourth day follow through. I noticed IBD said last night it wasn't follow through because yes, no, I didn't say fourth day follow through. So you know, do me a favor, make sure you read, you understand what you're reading, and know what you're reading before you start jumping to conclusions about what you think you're reading. I was jokingly saying, oh, it's a first day follow through, which is a very, very rare, rare occurrence, and uh, half men is a joke, and the fact that also. Uh, as a joke uh, regarding the fact that I don't pay attention really to what the indexes are doing. So if they, you know, I could call yesterday whatever I want, and we've seen IBD in various uh, junctures come up with new rules as to why something is now a follow-through day and blah, blah, blah. So I, it's more a joke than anything, so don't get too hung up on it. Um, hi, Gil. Who, who are the fab four from your tweet? I think I just covered them already. Twitter, Loco, KNW. And last but not least, what was the fourth one? I can't remember. Oh, Mobileye. Mobley, which is these are that's down. Let's see. Now it was up earlier. Pa uh, Palo Alto is now down, just a hair. Twitter is now uh, down. So you know everything coming in the markets. Instead of these names that I was long, I thought maybe they would drag the market higher, but that hasn't really been the case. It's kind of like the market has the, the big uh, tidal wave of the market selling is kind of knocked everything out so anyways um good time for that martini patient or patent you chat about yeah we were talking about that yesterday learned from schwab earlier this week that traders have the ability to sell large blocks of stock direct through a market maker so the orders don't show up on the second level right how do you find such information i don't know how do you find such information well, do why do I need to find it? Um, do you day trade news-driven stocks like Lake today? If so, how do you find the setups in pre-market? What? No, I don't know. I don't really play play around with that. Um, I have four stocks, not IBD or growth stocks per se, that I've had for one to one point five years that are up a bunch. Okay. There's a bunch of any thoughts on these? Um, not really. I mean, I, I don't. If you bought the stocks and they're not stocks that I would play with, HHC, Howard Hughes. Wow, that's uh, that's actually local to me. Uh, the old Howard Hughes building in the uh, his old runway. Uh, let's see, KW. I don't know. You know, what are you using as a sell rule? You know, you've got a violation of the 50-day on these. So, you know, you're asking for us to evaluate your portfolio. We don't do that. AOS had a breakout on 722.14, which fizzled. Was that day just short covering? How do I know? <laughs> First of all, on 714 would have been what around here. So. That I don't. Who knows what it was? You know, call those people up and and find out. I have no idea. Uh, 
Any other questions? Market's coming back. Okay, there's the low. Get long. Everybody get long. I think I'm joking, right? Could be. Baba. I was wondering when someone's going to ask about Baba. The illustrious Baba. Um, I don't know. There's not much to think about here. You're not really getting any kind of pocket pivots or anything just yet. You do have a 10-day moving average, so that's good. So, but, you know, I can't, uh, I can't say I'd be looking to buy anything. You got a weekly chart three weeks, uh, two weeks down here and trying to hold up this week, but who knows what's going to happen after today. It's a crazy day. It's a crazy market, and it's very hard to make uh, money, and sometimes either way, you know. I'm uh, very close to my peak for the year, about 2% off, and uh, just trying to hang in there as best as I can. And whenever I take shots, I try to keep very, very, very tight stops and try to, try to move earlier before it becomes obvious to everybody because I think when you, if you do uh, come in later, you're, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. Uh, let's see, any other questions? Not a lot to say. The market looks grim. You know, that's basically, let me get back to this. I think that we got a problem here. Uh, yeah, this is hooked up to something, so it keeps, whenever I click on something else. Uh, so now the market, market bounce, now maybe rolling back a little bit. Any opinion on rails? Yeah, they all suck, and you should have been out of them a long time ago because they all violated their moving averages like GBX violated. Well, for me, if I'm buying it up in here, if it, if it can't hold this gap up and break out, I'm gone. And I actually did own some of this, and it couldn't hold, so I sold it. Now it's come all the way to 200 days it's trying to bounce, but you violated the 50 days. So you, if you still own it, uh, you better ask yourself where you put your stops and whether you're even thinking about that. But that, nothing, I mean, if they look oversold, they get a lot more oversold. I'm not interested in them. Uh, did breakouts in the 1990s work because of retail traders? In other words, did institutions buy breakouts in the 1990s, or was it all retail buyers who, who made them work? How do I know? You guys, does, do you guys have some mythical idea that we like have this crystal ball that can see what retail buyers are doing and what institutional buyers are doing and what grandmothers are doing and what little kids doing stock uh, stuff in their class are doing, buying two shares of McDonald's? We have no idea. Who knows? All we know is that breakouts worked. But I can tell you why I think breakouts worked in the 90s and why uh, you were able to make a lot of money. It was a secular bull market, and money was flowing into the markets because you were looking at interest rates continuously coming down, coming down all the way. Uh, and I remember in 1994, uh, interest rates, I think, were around 7 8%, so much higher than they, they, were, they are now. Which they're almost nothing. But... You know, I think that's what drove it, and I think that's why a lot of this trending stuff worked. And I think you were in a post-war environment of uh, that was basically an expansionary environment economically. And, you know, as the economy grows, it spits out cash, and that cash has to be invested. And you have um, <clears throat> getting some uh, alerts going off there, Dr. K. And you have... Uh, some of that going into the markets and driving it up. So I think as things trended better because you had more consistent money flows, and I think now you've just got all this money printing that comes in because the bottom line is uh, I think 60 I, – I, I, somebody correct me on this if I'm wrong, but I, I read the other day something like 65% uh, of individual investors have blown off the market. So there. <laughs> Nobody wants to play. So we get back, you know, if these HFTs continue to dominate the game, you have to ask yourself, as I like to every once in a while, is if, what if someone rang the opening bell and nobody came? Then all the HFTs could play with each other. And uh, that would basically be that. Uh, somebody says, are you a wizard? What number am I thinking of? What's the meaning of life? Exactly. For shorting, when walking the plank, do you look a certain time frame, days, weeks? No. Let's take a look at something like, what was I looking at a little early? Yelp, is that right? Yeah. I mean, I would basically, walking the plank, uh, to me, I sort of altered that. It's not the terminology. It's just a fair flag, you know, and, and what happens is they come down, they consolidate, and you could say they're walking the plank, but it's, you know, just simplify it and just say it's a bear flag, end of story, and that's what it is. And so, 
you know, what, what happens is they go sideways and where you look to short them is you get a rally like in Yelp. So if, if this is another, notice another thing here is that if, if this is part of, uh, if this is part of a, a head and shoulder, so let's look here. You're kind of getting a left shoulder head and maybe this is forming a right shoulder. So there's sort of this fractal secondary H&S going on. And you have, uh, you look for these rallies. I look into the 20, uh, for rallies up into the 20 day first. And then if they go a little higher up to the 50 day, and that's basically what I'm looking for. I'm looking to short into the rallies up to the upper part of the bear flag and also using uh, either the either the highs or, and or the 20 day and 50 day together to kind of figure out where I'm at with it. So it's uh, pretty simple. Not all that comp complicated. Any Ebola rated plays here? No, we don't. Why? You, you don't want to. I mean, that that's so amateurish like, oh, Ebola, I'm going to I'm going to buy stocks that make Ebola cures, even though they say there isn't a cure right now. Is there, Dr. K? Is there a cure for Ebola? <laughs> Not that I know of. Not once it's past a certain point. Do either of you diversify with bonds, fixed income, etc.? Well, I diversify with, uh, let's see, uh, guitars. I have an extensive guitar collection. Those are hard assets. Gold, I like physical gold, but uh, I bought that a long time ago. Real estate's always nice, too. Uh, fast cars. Uh, fast women? No, actually, there's only one fast woman in my life. But um, I, yeah, we have. I have other assets, and I think you have to think about um, at least having some uh, hard assets and things uh, that that are you know within that realm uh, that can serve as, to some extent, uh, currency substitutes. Because I still think they're you know they're talking about the deficits only 400 and something billion. Only I remember when Bush was doing uh, those numbers, and I thought he was he was nuts. Now they hail that as a great achievement. Maybe it is in this environment, but you, you still have all of these uh, things coming up in the next few years uh, that are going to create more of a debt crisis. And I, I, as Dr. K said many times, the only way out of it really is to print, print, print. And so you got to think at some point uh, the dollar's got to get devalued. Either that, or we just default on our debt, and then who knows what that does to the dollar. But you could spend all day drinking martinis and trying to figure out all the different permutations of what might or might not happen. Uh, anyways, let's see. Let's see. MDM is like an index weather vane. It changes just about every day. Yellen blows some wind and MDM spins. How do you respond, Dr. K? Well, it's meant not to be a intraday model, first of all, uh, but when the volatility increases, then it's going to be switching signals more often, and when it's trending, then, you know, as you can see, some of these signals, it'll sit on for a couple months, while, uh, you know, as long as the market's not doing anything wrong. So increasing volatility will, of course, you know, inc increase winds, you know, you get, like, gust force winds and things, and the MDM's going to take note, and it's going to adjust. If the volatility becomes unpredictable, then it just goes to cash and waits it out. Yeah. Starbucks just announced they will make a new Gilmo tin. Okay, not sure what that is, but okay, sounds good. Let's see, any any other? How about any just like nasty comments, uh, derisive comments, anything like that? Something fun? Uh, no, just. What do you think of Bollinger bands? Uh, are they useful? I don't use them, so I couldn't tell you. I use other funky stuff. Uh, and I, yeah, there's a there's hundred different indicators you can use or tools you can use. And, I mean, you know, some of them will have validity. And, um, you know, you just have to know, uh, create rules around whatever tools you use uh, that work. Yeah. Let's see. The NASDAQ is trying to turn here. I'm watching this on an intraday basis. Um, where is – here we go. Here we go. You can see here it's trying to turn. But – if the line doesn't cross, I don't know. We'll see what happens. It's trying to get up above the 20 period, but it's it's doing its best to try and turn. But for all you know, this is just one leg. Uh, you have one leg down. I'll make that two legs down, and you're just setting up here for a third one. And we're going to be down 500 points by the close, which will be two hours and 15 minutes from now. Somebody says it's sushi time. It's feeling that way. Uh, somebody says, so we should buy TQQQ. Uh, meaning what? That the market is at a uh, because of this. I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't buy uh, ETFs anyway. So I don't know. I'm just gonna sit with these shorts and see how they pan out. If they don't, I go away and maybe I'll sit in cash for a little while and go golfing for a few days. But to me, this market is just uh, nutty. 
uh, and to be up on a day you know, to make money on the long side when I come in so heavy uh, you know on leverage on margin and uh, and make money on the longs as the market blows to pieces is kind of bizarre too would you use this weakness to buy into your fab four or wait for a pocket pivot I think I just answered that question I'm not really interested in doing much anything right now what are your best VDU buys so far this year um, I don't know. I mean, look at maybe something like GoPro when it was, uh, whoops, we got to go over here. When it was drying up down here, you saw it pulling back along the 10-day and drying up in here, and then it took off. That was the beginning of the run. I think uh, Loco right in here, you saw a volume dry up right along the 10-day. So those are some of the good, the best ones. Um, But I'm not so sure I'd be looking to buy into things here. Watch how some of these acts, see what the market does. I mean, you're coming in. Twitter's holding up again. Let's see, Loco. These are the four that I like. It's kind of hanging along the 10-day. So maybe if you think the market's going to bottom and head higher, for me, it's not really something I have to uh, mess with right now. So, And I'm not. Grub holding up reasonably well. Yeah, somebody was babbling about a... Uh, uh, IPO share lockup coming off on October 1st. So let's see, this was, here's October 1st right here. And the stock's been going up ever since then. So just proof that you can't really short these turkeys, thinking that just because there's a share lockup, you're going to make a bunch of money uh, on the short side. Well, I don't know. We're kind of getting towards the end of the hour here. There's not a lot. I have to talk about other than you know I'd be I'd be cautious uh, based on what you're seeing. So market's picking up on you're bouncing, but I I got a nasty feeling you might be testing uh, the lows again. We'll see. So, but it, you know either that or you're just going into this vol uh, volatile mush that isn't going to really get you anywhere, and you're just going to get spun back and forth in the spin cycle. So, I would say be uh, be cautious here. Uh, GWPH. I, uh, that one, you know, I wouldn't buy stocks when when you get a pocket pivot like that. That's constructive, but I think it needs more time to set up. It's coming in, and I wouldn't just buy it willy-nilly today because it bounces right into the 10-day. Uh, I think it may need time. The other thing is when the if you can buy something like this closer to the moving average rather than when it's already up, you know, seven eight bucks, uh, you're probably better off. Uh, than, than trying to come into it here because you got all this overhead and so I'm not this one I'm not really uh, all that excited about and in most cases I would only take the action as potentially constructive but it's going to have to improve within the context of uh, an overall improving pattern so that's about all I have to say about that somebody says I think this time is good for the webinar I think so too because it gave us a chance to see where the market was going after yesterday's a uh, big move, and I think the verdict uh, is pretty clear here that uh, this market's screwed. It, at least in terms of the volatility being so funky and the action being so funky that you really can't make enough sense of it to make any money, and they're just going to spin you around uh, back and forth, then I, I think uh, you're probably just better off sitting in cash. So <clears throat> All I know is I got my shorts are working for me a little here. I'm just going to hang out and see what happens. If they if they don't, uh, I'll just get stopped out and move along. But I think, hmm, let's see, who wants to bet? I think, Dr. K, do you think we're going to see lower lows by the close, or do you think Mark's going to rally from here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's. Uh, I think I think we're... Um, I'd be surprised, actually, if we broke uh, today's lows. But you know what? It, it, Mark lives a surprise. But yeah, if I, if you, if you pin me to the wall and say you gotta make a bet here, I would say that we're not going to break the lows of the day. Okay, I think we're going to be down. And the volume right, the volume right now is um, it's a little higher on the New York and and lower on the Nasdaq. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, let's see. Meanwhile, let's see. I'm going to say just to be contrarian, uh, I'm going to say we'll be down uh, down 500 on the Dow by the close. It's just going to get really nasty. There are no buyers. I don't know who's selling. Somebody's selling with a lot of persistence here. And uh, they're not going after names like, say, Twitter and Palo Alto Networks uh, or an app, although it's coming in a little bit. But uh, they are. Well, you know, it could be it could be um, an institutional stance with enough big money saying, "Okay, QE's over this month." So while the market could rally yesterday, you know, and they're going to stand aside from that rally, they're also going to 
short into any kind of rally because they just sort of see uh, this market being corrective, um, you know, after this month is over. Right. All right. So we're down. We're down 259 on the Dow at that point. Uh, we'll see where we end up by there. But I don't think I have anything else to say. Market thing theme song. Will it go round in circles? Not will he go round in circles. I think it's will it go round in circles. But I remember that old Billy Preston tune. I actually do have it in my awesome iTunes collection. Uh, somebody says, as more institutions like Kelpers ditch hedge funds, more will follow suit. Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I have to say, having run hedge funds, uh, the fact that you really can't get a grasp on the markets these days uh, it makes it hard for hedge funds and for the fees that you pay, which I think is 2 and 20, 2% and 20% profit uh, fees. Uh, here we go. We're going lower, Dr. K. You're going to owe me some sushi. Uh, oh, I forgot to put the bet in. But anyways, um, yeah, I think so. I think hedge funds are, are uh, kind of gone, the, you know, the, the going to go the way of the dinosaur, I think. Or, no, the New York Stock Exchange floor broker. How's that? But, you know, in general, I think uh, this market sucks. And uh, I think we're headed lower. So I'm still up on the day. So I don't, you know, it's kind of like this morning. I was wishing the market had made me go, you know, had turn me negative and I can just blow out of my positions. Nothing worse than being up on the day when the market's going down. You don't necessarily sell out, but at the same time you don't want to see your profits disappear. So push did come to shove and I did blow my positions out, bag any profits I had and move to the short side. Market went lower. So that's all I know today. And it seems to change on a day-to-day -day basis. I think this is mostly a day trader's market. Uh, Dr. K, someone says they're detecting a British accent on you. Is that, that could happen. No, that's funny. Well, yeah, because my accent, uh, some people have said, has been so bastardized between Amsterdam, Cape Town, <laughs> and London. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe. <laughs> I wouldn't mind. Yeah, well, yeah that's, that's fine. So I actually have a California accent. I used to talk like a, a, a Mexican day laborer, but now I'm, I'm, much, I'm much better. I used to talk like the guy on the El Pollo Loco commercials. Welcome to El Pollo Loco. Yeah. The... Uh, would you like to buy some stocks? <clears throat> uh, hmm, everything coming back in. I don't know. This is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, and if what I said earlier about the you know, institutions seeing this as, you know, more collectively seeing this as, as um, the you know, market being corrected because of the end of QE, and therefore they're selling into rallies, of course that's going to put a, 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 a cap on the Feeling markets. On the, on the market. There we go. Well, anyways, so ugly day. Uh, that's really all I've got. We're at the end of the hour pretty much. I'd like to kind of get back to watching this market because I think we're going to roll over. And if I see anything that's rallying, I think I want to hit it short, maybe double up on my positions. Watching Tesla bounce off the lows, it might be a spot to double up. Let's take a look. Remember, we're looking at, uh, we'll finish off looking at where the market's at right now. We were looking at the NASDAQ potentially trying to make a turn. Well, that's failed. And you notice the six line never crossed. Now you're getting this MACD line starting to cross. You've got a MACD stretch on the upside. Yeah, there's a good chance to make lows. What were the, the lows anyways uh, on the day? Like 16, uh, 730? 43.81 on the, on the NASDAQ. So that's about 12 points away or so. Uh, let's see. Dr. K, how big will the EU QE be versus uh, what the U.S. one was? How does he know? What do you have Depends, whatever it depends on exactly what they decide. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> they, haven't, they haven't made it clear how much it will be, so you know, anyone's guess. Same thing with Tesla. You see this? You see, here's here's where you have the rally back up to the 20 period line. If, if I'm already short, and uh, you know, it comes down, maybe take a little profits down here, holding a core position. You can put everything back out as it comes up to the 20 line, and then use that as a quick stop. But you know, this thing's all over the place right now. And uh, I, I think it's probably heading lower on the basis of the uh, fractal head and shoulders. And it's heading lower. And I think uh, you could hold a small position into the announcement, which I think is right at the close. And it's going to tank 30 points. So um, anyway, someone says, thank you, gentlemen, eliminating an informative. Well, we try to give you your money's worth. As I told the guy, I chewed out on the chat room. I think it was yesterday. Uh, anyways. This market sucks, and I think we're going through the lows by the close. So that's all. Dr. K thinks we may may hold. We'll see. 
Uh, I think when it comes down to it, it neither is he, uh, neither here nor there. Any of these predictions, I think, it boils down to what the stocks are doing. So watch your stops if you have any longs. Know where your out points are. Are you using the seven-week rule, which means you're using either the 10-day or the 50-day, and review that, uh, you know, as your uh, as your downside stops. So, anyways, that's all we got. So, as we uh, stand on the brink of the end of the world as we know it, uh, we bid you adieu. So we'll catch you guys next time. So long, everyone.